All right, class, we'll start chapter five, which is the shoulder joint. Ooh, look at this shoulder range of motion. You wonder why people get rotator cuff injuries? Well, <laughs> this doesn't even seem normal, does it? Well, unfortunately, this is what most pitchers go through on one pitch. So the shoulder joint itself is the attached to the axial skeleton. Scapular movement usually occurs with movement of the humerus. So humeral, so glenohumeral, flexion and abduction requires scapula elevation, upward rotation, and abduction. So last week we talked about that. So if your scapula is tight, well then of course it will affect glenohumeral flexion and abduction. Humeral adduction extension result in depression, downward rotation, and scapula adduction. Scapula abduction occurs with humeral internal rotation and horizontal adduction, where scapula adduction occurs with humeral external rotation and horizontal abduction. So you can see how close the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint are, and one cannot function properly without the other. A wide range of motion of the shoulder joint in many different places requires a significant amount of laxity. Common, very common, to have instability problems. You can get rotator cuff impingement. You can get subluxations. You can get dislocations. The price of mobility is reduced stability. Remember in week one and two, we talked about each joint is either mobile or stable. Since the shoulder joint is so mobile, well, you get reduced stability. So the uh, good true false question is the more mobile a joint is, the less stable it is. And the more stable a joint is, such as the uh, hip, the less mobile it is. Uh, so you should know every single bone here and the bony landmarks. So scapula, clavicle, and humerus serve as attachments for shoulder joint muscles. The scapular landmarks are the supraspinatus fossa, infraspinatus fossa, subscapular fossa, spine of the scapula, glenoid cavity, coracoid process, and acromion process, and the inferior angle. Scapula, clavicle, and humerus serve as attachments for shoulder joint muscles. Humeral landmarks, the head, greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubricular groove, and the deltoid tuberosity. So if you look at this right here, there's the head of the humerus. There's the greater tubercle, there's the lesser tubercle, here's the intertubricular groove where your biceps tendon goes in, here's the deltoid tuberosity where the deltoid will attach, and then you have the trochlea and the capitulum. So the radius would be here and the ulna would be on this side. So this is a right humerus here. Some other key landmarks are the glenoid fossa, lateral border, inferior angle, medial border, and superior angle. So take a look at this. Here is the glenohumeral joint in a nutshell. See that? See so really, so the head of the humerus should fit into this glenoid cavity here, but obviously it's not like the acetabulum and the hip where it's a deep fossa. This is a pretty shallow groove, so it really relies on the rotator cuff and all the ligaments to hold it in place. But because it has so much mobility, right, it's not going to be very stable. Okay, so there's the clavicle, here's the chromium process, here's, okay, so just take a look at that. Now, the glenoid labrum, which is injured in a lot of overhead athletes, especially pitchers, it slightly enhances stability by deepening the concavity of the fossa, serves as a buttress to excessive humeral head translation, so it prevents it from going too far superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, may be injured with sudden overhead movements and with trauma. Here's the glenohumeral ligaments provide stability, especially anteriorly and inferiorly. Okay, so you, if you get anterior subluxations or inferior subluxations, then you rip through these ligaments right here, which are pretty common in uh, overhead athletes. The inferior glenohumeral ligament ligaments are quite lax until extreme ranges of motion are reached because of a wide range of motion involved. Stability, again, is sacrificed to gain mobility. Determining exact range of movement is difficult because of accompanying shoulder girdle movement. So here's backward extension. You should have about 60 degrees forward flexion. Okay. 
usually it's about 120 degrees of pure glenohumeral uh, forward flexion and then the last 60 degrees is your scapula. So again abduction 120 degrees is pure glenohumeral motion and then the other 60 degrees is scapula. So where people lack usually is they have good glenohumeral uh, motion but the scapula doesn't do as well or the uh, AC joint and the clavicle don't do as well. So then people end up jamming their glenohumeral joint because they think that's the problem but then they overstretch their ligaments. So um, you really need to know where the limitation is. Is the limitation actually in the glenohumeral joint or is it in the scapula before you start the rehab process? Okay, here's horizontal adduction and there's horizontal abduction. Here's external rotation, here's internal rotation. So glenohumeral joint, you have 90 to 100 degrees of abduction, and then you have zero degrees of adduction or 75 degrees of anterior to the trunk. So here's abduction, okay? You get zero to 90 to 100 degrees, 120 degrees, okay? Then you have adduction that goes to zero degrees, but then you can go across your body to another 75 degrees. Glenohumeral extension could be 40 to 60 degrees. And then it could be 90 to 100 degrees of flexion. It could be 120 degrees, but depending on how much scapular movement you have. Glenohumeral internal external rotation, 70 degrees of internal rotation, 90 degrees of external. Horizontal abduction, you get about 45 degrees, and you can have 130 to 135 degrees of horizontal adduction because you have to go across the body. So here's a good chart. Uh, uh, again, uh, since this is a movement anatomy class, we want to be, all the quizzes will focus more on movements. So not so much origin insertion because that's anatomy, but this is movements. So I really want you to know what movements um, and what are the actions that occur at the shoulder joint and the shoulder girdle. So in order for up abduction to take place, AB as in boy, you need upper rotation of the shoulder girdle. For adduction to take place, you want downward rotation. For flexion, the shoulder girdle must elevate and upward rotate. For extension, it must depress and downwardly rotate, right? So slash meaning, uh, okay. Internal rotation, you get abduction and protraction. External rotation, you get adduction and retraction. Horizontal abduction, retraction, horizontal adduction, abduction and protraction. And this is a great chart for you to uh, memorize. The glenohumeral joint is paired with the shoulder girdle to accomplish the total range of motion. For example, 170 to 180 degrees of total abduction includes approximately 60 degrees of scapular upward rotation. 25 degrees of scapular elevation and about 95 to 100 degrees of glenohumeral abduction. Okay, so let's say they're lacking glenohumeral abduction. You don't want to just keep jamming the glenohumeral joint without working on the scapula. A lot of therapists miss that whole point. They'll jam that glenohumeral joint up into it, but they really need to work scapular elevation by 25 degrees and scapular upward rotation by 60 degrees. The scapulohumeral rhythm, synergistic relationship between the glenohumeral joint and the shoulder girdle. Generally accepted ratio is two to one. For every two degrees of glenohumeral motion, there's one degree of scapular motion. So meaning if you have 120 degrees of flexion, then you should have 60 degrees of scapular movement. That's a two to one ratio, but it can vary uh, between individuals. The glenohumeral joint is frequently injured due to its anatomical design. The shallowness of the glenoid fossa, the laxity of the ligamentous structures, the lack of strength, endurance, and muscles, mainly the rotator cuff, and injury results in anterior and anterior inferior glenohumeral subluxations or dislocations, which are very common. Posterior dislocations, which are rare, but if you do MMA or UFC, then you can get any kind of uh, dislocation there. And posterior instability problems, which are problem. So here's a shoulder dislocation, 
Here's a normal shoulder. There's a dislocation here. There's Ennis Cantor when he <laughs> dislocated it. Um, Kevin Love has dislocated it. So there's a lot of been ba a lot of basketball players that have dislocated it. So here's the clavicle, and then there's the dislocation where it's anterior dislocation. Rotator cuff, uh, you should know everything there is to know about the rotator cuff because that's common injury in rehab, common injury in a lot of patients. Rotator cuff is frequently injured, made up of the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, attaches to the front, top, and rear of the humeral head. The point of insertion enables humeral rotation vital in maintaining the humeral head in correct approximation within the glenoid fossa while the more powerful muscles move the humerus through its wide range of motion. Oof! Look at this. I mean it's unreal. This is a slider um, but the range of motion, the torque that's put on this is just unreal. I, don't, I mean that's not normal. I mean look at this. Obviously it's normal for uh, uh, baseball player, but this this is a lot of torque on the rotator cuff. Now, glenohumeral interrotation deficit or GERD, this is a common uh, uh, stretch that you might see pitchers do, but really uh, new research shows that you might overstretch the ligaments and really looking at your rib cage and looking at your diaphragm, the ability to inhale and exhale may be a better route of going at it and looking at hip positioning versus just tackling the shoulder joint. So if you do this, you may want to look at the, your infrasternal angle. You may want to look at your diaphragm. You may want to look at your uh, pelvis first and then go to this second versus a lot of times coaches will have, to have you do this stretch and you don't fix the hip or the rib cage. So the difference in internal rotation range of motion between the individuals throwing and non-throwing shoulder. Overhead athletes with a GERD, gunohumeral internal rotation deficit of greater than 20% have a higher risk of injury. Stretching exercises are recommended to regain amount of internal rotation necessary to improve function and reduce likelihood of injury. But really uh, over the years I've, uh, I've stopped doing this stretch and started addressing their diaphragm and rib cage and hip and have had better results. So here's the movements. Here's glenohumeral abduction upward lateral movement of the humerus out to the side away from the body. Here's glenohumeral adduction, downward movement of the humerus immediately toward the body from abduction. Here's glenohumeral flexion, movement of humerus straight anteriorly. Here's horizontal adduction or transverse flexion. You don't hear transverse flexion too much, so use horizontal adduction. Movement of humerus in a horizontal or transverse plane across the body or chest. Horizontal abduction, movement of humerus in a horizontal or transverse plane away from the chest. External rotation, movement of humerus laterally around its long axis away from midline. Internal rotation movement of humerus medially around as long as toward the midline. Here's diagonal abduction, movement of humerus in a diagonal plane away from the midline. Diagonal adduction, movement of humerus in a diagonal plane toward the midline. All right.